Another man cast in the same mold was Henry Seagrave. He was born to uh, an Irish mother and an American father in Baltimore, but was always seen as the quintessential Englishman. Uh, with a name like Henry O'Neill de Hayne Seagrave, I mean, you can't really ignore the fact that he's a very British person. But uh, an upbringing in Baltimore, uh, and the first thing he wanted to do when he got back to England was succeed for England. Like so many of their generation who had survived the conflict and danger of World War I, both Campbell and Seagrave had been fighter pilots and found the return to civilian life boring. For them, the excitement of speed was everything, and they were soon getting their kicks racing around the steeply banked circuit at Brooklyn's racetrack. Seagrave was very quick, but he was also very intelligent. He knew how to pace himself, how to save his car, to drive at just as fast a pace as he needed to, and then to push when he really needed to. Very, very shrewd, very clever race driver. When Malcolm was motor racing, he was always on a circuit, and he felt he was being restricted by the limitations of a circuit. The lap record at Brooklands at one time was the land speed record. It was as fast as you could go. But for both Campbell and Seagrave, just being the fastest was not enough. They had to win for their country. You have a man who has the ego and the desire to go quicker than anyone else, but it's not self-satisfaction. Both of them were competitive, but both of them wanted to do it out of a sense of patriotism. Both of them wanted to push the country forward. The land speed record had gone on rising when in 1904, France took the record at 103 miles per hour. In 1914, Britain took it back at 125. Also, the rules of record breaking were being standardized. Rules are actually delightfully simple. Um, the car must have four or more wheels. This is the current definition. Um, and it must be steered by two of them, so that defines the car. And it must simply make two opposite direction passes over a measured mile or a measured kilometre within one hour. And the hour starts from the moment you enter the measured mile on the first pass and basically it finishes when you leave the measured mile on the, on the second pass. Very, very simple. By the early 1920s, the chase for the land speed record intensified, but to get speed, you needed power. What actually happens is the power requirement increases as a cube of the speed. So if your car goes 100 miles an hour and you want to go 200 miles an hour, you need eight times the power. It's very, very simple. So that's why all the Brooklyn's racers had to move away from the conventional racers <laughs> looking cars to putting these huge surplus of World War I aero engines in because that was the only cheap and available form of power for them. Immediately, designers and drivers began to experiment with cars powered by these new type of engines. The brilliant chief designer of Sunbeam, based in Wolverhampton, was Louis Cotelin. He built a 350 horsepowered car designed around a naval aircraft engine with a capacity of over 18,000 cc, 18 liters. But to build such a car cost money. A lot of these people were very wealthy, and so therefore they could actually afford to individually fund their cars. Malcolm Campbell, I think, never actually paid for any of his cars, but I think he got all his friends to pay. <laughs> in 1922, Ken Elm Lee Guinness took Cotelan's 350 horsepowered Sunbeam to Brooklyn's racetrack in Surrey, and over two measured miles pushed the record to 133 miles per hour. One of the spectators was Malcolm Campbell. He was convinced he could push the car to even greater speeds and make certain that the record stayed in Britain. Malcolm Campbell saw the potential in that car and more or less begged to buy it. Uh, it was once he bought that car and used the technology that had been put in place, that's where the land speed record really took off. At the time, many drivers dreamt of making the land speed record their goal, but it was a challenge that few had the skills to take on. One of the things that people sometimes mistakenly think is that with a land speed record car, all you do is sit there, hold the wheel for sake of appearance and get your foot down. Very different in reality. You're in a car 25, 30 feet long with 900 horsepower, six inch wide tires, if that. You have a massive 
clutch and gearbox to operate. You've got the wind and the sand and the spray blasting past you. It, it wasn't a happy environment. So these were genuine heroes in those days. But for many of these heroes, there were to be failures and tragedies before the dream to be the fastest man on Earth could be fulfilled. By 1924, Malcolm Campbell, with his dashing good looks and strong charisma, had become one of Britain's most talked about drivers. So far, he had tried four times unsuccessfully to break the land speed record, which now stood at 145 miles per hour. But the naming of his cars had created a legend. One evening, he was watching a play called The Bluebird of Happiness by Morris Metterling. Uh, and it was a, a famous play at the time. It was a fairy story searching for the elusive bird of happiness, which is always just out of your grasp. Uh, and Grandfather was so enthralled by this play that he thought, ah, here is a name for my next car. And he literally went home that night, woke up the local ironmonger, uh, and bought every tin of blue paint that he could find, painted the car blue. He then christened it the Blue Bird drove the car to Brooklands with the paint still wet apparently, and drove around Brooklands, won his first race with it, and from that moment onwards, everything was called Bluebird. But lucky colour or not, Campbell's good fortune was about to change when his great rival entered the ring, Henry Dehaene Seagrave. Seagrave had been thrust into the public eye when he won the 1923 French Grand Prix. The Grand Prix at Tour, a distance of 496 miles. The race was won at an average speed of 75.3 miles an hour by Henry Seagrave. As Seagrave was drinking his celebratory glass of champagne, which he claimed he didn't like, saying that he preferred water, the Sunbeam Motor Company was looking to him as a possible new champion in the land speed record race. I think there was always competition for the Lancet record. Uh, Seagrave obviously came on the scene um, as a very successful racing driver at Brooklands and was a very, very accomplished Grand Prix driver. And again, Seagrave was probably absorbed by this desire to go quicker. With Seagrave getting ready to attempt the land speed record, the pressure was on Campbell to break it first. With his backers beginning to lose patience, he felt he had to find somewhere in Britain to race his car. Malcolm wanted to go quicker, and he set his ambition on being the first man to achieve 150 miles an hour. And you couldn't do that at uh, Brooklands or on a circuit. So you had to find a stretch that was long enough and wide enough and safe enough to do that. He chose a little known stretch of beach on which to attempt his run. Situated on the Carmarthen coast in Wales, it was called Pendine Sands. It was so remote that even the guidebooks did not mention it. By chance, um, the RAC had been in West Wales looking at suitable places to put on this section of the International Six Days Trial for Motorcycles. And while they were there, they, they uh, surveyed, in the proper sense of the word, um, Pendine and came to the conclusion that its seven miles of straight sand would in fact uh, present a suitable alternative for world land speed record attempts. In September 1924, Campbell climbed into Bluebird for his fifth attempt at the land speed record. He was very superstitious, uh, and he would only get into the car from one side, have his little routine, and he had a lucky, lucky black cat mascot that a lady gave him at Brooklyn. I think he, he was very frightened. I think he, he was very scared. But this feeling of fear was, seemed to be what turned him on. But on the first day, luck was still against him as his wheels spun on the soft sand. The next day, the weather was against him, but refusing to admit defeat, Campbell decided to have a go. With wind, spray and sand flying against the car, he made two runs. His speed was 146 miles per hour. He had finally done it. Malcolm Campbell was at last 
the fastest man on earth. Campbell's first record was probably more a relief than a feeling of pride. He knew the car was going to get the land speed records. It was more than capable. I think really with the 350 horsepower Sunbeam, it was more of a feeling of I told you so than outright pride. Within a year, he was back. And this time, he finally achieved his ambition of being the first man to go 150 miles per hour. But for Campbell, this wasn't enough. He wanted to break the 180 or three miles a minute barrier. But Seagrave now appeared with a vehicle powerful enough to attack Campbell's record. The machines in the early days tended to be racing cars, which already existed, because money was then and still is tight for any kind of record-breaking activity. So somebody like Seagrave would look around and say, right, there's a four-litre sunbeam, that's what I want. On the 16th of March, Seagrave took his new sunbeam onto the sands of Southport, Lancashire. His car was much smaller than Campbell's monster racers. It had a four-litre V12 supercharged engine, and it represented an attempt to match the speed of the bigger aero engine-powered rivals. Seagrave had grave doubts as to whether his supercharger would hold out, so he used a limited amount of throttle on his first run. Encouraged that all was well, he set off again under full throttle, when suddenly he hit a patch of sand which threw the car into the air. Managing to keep the car under control, he finished his run, and on his first attempt, he had broken the land speed record at 152 miles per hour. This was not good news for Malcolm Campbell. Malcolm had actually struggled for all his early records. Henry Seagrave had become the first Englishman to win a Grand Prix abroad, and he'd taken to land speed record breaking relatively easily. There had been no hold-ups, no failures, no difficulty in getting a car from Sunbeam. He'd just walked straight in and taken a record. And there's a strongly rumoured story that there was a conversation at Povey Cross that said Malcolm had fronted him and said, you had it too easy. You haven't Henry had to Seagrave like the rest too of contacted Louis Cotelin at Sunbeam and asked him to build him a car capable of going 200 miles per hour. He went to Louis Cotelin at Sunbeam and said, how can we do this? Now, Cotelin was a very shrewd, clever Breton. So in the Sunbeam works, they had two V12 aero engines from the war. They put two of those in the car together. The 1,000 horsepower Sunbeam cost probably 10,000 pounds in 1926 to but build. both he and Campbell were now hearing stories that Seagrave's new car looked like breaking the unheard of 200 miles per hour barrier but it was a car that was shrouded in secrecy and kept away from the newsreel cameras a lot of secrecy obviously surrounded Cotalan didn't want anyone to know what he was working on inevitably the stories began to leak out so when it finally appeared the mystery racer it used to be called everyone just stood back in amazement. Because after all the rumours, here was this thing that was even more spectacular than they'd been led to believe. When finally the car was unveiled, even Seagrave was in awe of it. Weighing in at nearly four tonnes, this 1,000 horsepower monster was powered by two aero engines. What they came up with was using two old aero engines but they put one in front of the driver, one behind, driving via chains to the rear wheels. So Seagrave sat between two 450 horsepower engines, one exhausting in front of him, one right behind his head. When he first saw it, Seagrave marvelled at the car. I stood and stared at the monster, rather as a child would have done. It fascinated me. The thought that I was to drive it, control it, and unleash all its potentials was, one must admit, a little unnerving. It is the only time I can honestly say when I have stood in front of a car and doubted human ability to control it. Despite its size, this incredible car acquired a rather unusual nickname. The idea was that it would be very aerodynamic, so you'd have the chassis, all the equipment, and then it would be cloaked in a very smooth aerodynamic body shell. It looked like an upturned boat, but equally it looked like a slug, which somebody in the factory said it looks like a slug, and that's where the nickname stuck. It was estimated that the slug would need nine miles to reach its maximum speed, far beyond the length of Pendine Sands. 
so Seagrave decided to try the American beach of Daytona in Florida. The death of Parry Thomas had a chilling effect on Seagrave as his car had two chain drives. But when he arrived in Daytona, the pressure increased. The American press had gone into a frenzy and loudly announced that he was going for the 200 miles per hour barrier. When Seagrave went to Daytona, first of all, there's this massive packing crate which arrived. So it was the old thing again, like, here's the mystery race of what does it look like? Once it was taken out of its box, everyone was just completely stunned by the appearance of it. Nobody had seen anything like it before. Everybody knew Seagrave had gone to America to be the first man to achieve 200 miles an hour. There was no little steps. You don't go into Uncle Sam's back garden just to increase the record by a couple of miles an hour. He was there to hit the first really big major target, 200 miles an hour in a car. Seagrave was already being treated as a hero, and the burden of failure was intense. He knew that his main sponsor, Sunbeam, would have difficulty in convincing their shareholders to continue investment if the attempt failed. On a brilliantly sunny morning on March the 29th, 1927, 30,000 spectators looked on as Seagrave carefully took the slug onto the sands of Daytona. At 11 a.m., Seagrave started his first run. At 90 miles per hour, he changed up to second gear. And about 130 miles per hour, he moved the gear lever into top. From then on, he pushed the throttle as far as it would go. On his first run, Seagrave had taken the slug to an incredible 207 miles per hour. As he reached the end of the track, his brakes failed and he had to slow down in the shallow water. Having only an hour to make both runs, the race was on to repair his brakes in time. Working at feverish pitch, he was soon off on his second leg. This time, he achieved 200 miles per hour. After checking the timings, the officials announced that Seagrave and the slug had broken the 200 barrier with an astonishing 203 miles per hour. If you imagine the, the kind of era we're talking about, suddenly you have a Britain with this massive international triumph, not 180 miles an hour, but 203. Malcolm Campbell's previous record, 174, it was a massive leap. And he'd done it abroad, in America. He'd shown the world what we could do. Seagrave had taken the land speed record into new territory and had thrown down the challenge not only to Campbell, but also to the Americans. The race was on to beat that record, but in doing so, there would be more heartaches and deaths. By 1927, the duel between Henry Seagrave and Malcolm Campbell to be the first to 200 miles per hour had been won when Seagrave took his car to 203 miles per hour. But far from discouraging Campbell, it spurred him on to even greater efforts. The rivalry and the uh, competitive spirit in Malcolm would be, well, well done, Seagrave, you know, good record attempt, but at the back of his mind, he'd be going, you so-and-so, you've beaten me to, to 200, and um, now I don't have a car. I've now got to build a new car uh, and go faster, and therefore 250 would be his next target. And that next effort was on February the 4th, 1928, when Malcolm Campbell took his latest Bluebird to Daytona. The car now had a 23-litre, 12-cylinder aircraft engine, similar to the one which powered the Schneider Airplane Trophy winner to 281 miles per hour. With this brute of a car, Campbell took Bluebird to 206 miles per hour. Once again, the record was his, but not for long. Two months later, an American, Ray Keach, and his car called the Spirit of Elkdom entered the battle. The American believed the answer was simply to throw on more power, and with three aircraft engines in his 81-litre giant, Ray Keach raised the record to 207 miles per hour. When uh, Ray Keach took the record, the first thing that 
Campbell said about it was, how on earth can you take a record with a thing like that? It was three engines bolted to a chassis with a guy sitting in a chair with next to no bodywork. To both Campbell and Seagrave, it was diabolical. More importantly for Campbell, Britain had lost its hold over the land speed record and the international fight was now gearing up. Malcolm was, was quite happy if it was a Brit breaking his record and it was still British and it was still showing British engineering to be the best in the world. But for an American to come along and get in on the act, so I think that uh, spurred him on even more. But before either Campbell or Seagrave could come back into the arena, there was another death. In April 1928, American Frank Lockhart, driving his Stutz Black Hawk, was killed at Daytona trying to break Ray Keach's record. What had happened, he damaged one of the tires and when it blew, the car just went completely out of control and a barrel rolled flying 10 feet over the head of the crowd. And when it landed, Lockhart was actually thrown at the feet of his wife. It was a horrible accident, very much like Parry Thomas's in terms of its impact. Because again, now everyone knew that this was a very deadly pursuit. But America still held the record and both Campbell and Seagrave were determined to bring the trophy back to Britain. Seagrave, by this time, needed to get his record back. He wasn't content, just like Malcolm Campbell wasn't, to have somebody else quicker. He, this time, raised some money from Charles Cheers Wakefield, the founder of Castrol Oil. Between them, they got Jack Irving to come up with yet another revolutionary car. The car they came up with was called the Golden Arrow. It was a monster. At over 27 feet long and six feet wide, this 900 horsepower car had the hopes of Britain riding on its chassis. Possibly the most beautiful car ever built for the land speed record. It's just perfect. Nothing wrong with it at all. J.S. Irving had done a job there that can never be beaten. It was a perfect design. The result was absolutely stunning. I can vouch for that as a four-year-old kid, just being able to peep over the top of the panniers and seeing this wonderful expanse of gold bodywork that was just completely stunning to look at. And the, the final little thing that it had was the gun sight on the scuttle so that he could line it up down Daytona Beach. But the idea was, this is like a rifle bullet. But it was a wonderful, iconic land speed record car, probably one of the most beautiful ever built. On March the 11th, 1929, Seagrave was back in Daytona and ready to try for the record once again. Unleashing the arrows 27 litres, he sped across the sands. At 170 miles per hour, he changed into top gear and flew through the measured mile. The first run was timed at 15 seconds, 231 miles per hour. Six minutes later, and with all four wheels changed, he started his return run. This time, he was almost as fast again. When the timings were averaged, Seagrave had driven the Golden Arrow at 231 miles per hour. Britain had taken back the land speed record. Seagrave 231, he'd eradicated everything that had gone before. The impact of this was incredible because this car literally was just out the packing crate, up and down the beach, bang, new record. So you can imagine the effect on the American psyche. In London, Seagrave's anxious sponsors and designers were waiting in an office when the telephone rang. Speaking via the brand new transatlantic telephone system, Seagrave said quite simply, Daytona calling. This is Seagrave speaking. It's all right. She's done it. Two days later, America picked up the challenge with an 81-litre car. 
It was driven by an inexperienced taxi driver turned motor mechanic, Lee Bible. On its third run, disaster struck when the car swerved, killing both Bible and a news cameraman. America had failed in its attempt and would not retake the record for another 34 years. On his return to Britain, Seagrave received a welcome only usually given to royalty. A special train bearing his name whisked him to London, where the king knighted him. A fact that was not overlooked by Campbell. Again, it would have just added to, to Malcolm's competitive spirit. Well, on one hand, he would pay high congratulations to Seagrave. But he'd be at the back of his mind, well, he's been knighted. He's only been doing record breaking for a relatively short time. Um, why haven't I been knighted? But shortly afterwards, Seagrave made a momentous decision and announced his intention to retire from Land Speed Records. He reflected, I have raced for eight years and have already exceeded my allotted span of luck. I shall tempt fate no longer. When Bible was killed, that was what decided Seagrave that, OK, now is the time to rest on the laurels. 231 miles an hour was so much faster than anyone, even Campbell, that for at least a couple of years, he was going to have some respite from record breaking on land. That was when he decided, we've done this, we've got a good enough figure, now we can go after the water record. Seagrave had long been fascinated with speedboats, and the thought of holding both land and water records greatly appealed to him. On Friday the 13th of June, 1930, Seagrave took his boat, Miss England II, onto Lake Windermere in an attempt at the world water record, which stood at 92 miles per hour. At 1.15 p.m., he started the first run. And by the second, his speed was 98 miles per hour, a new world record. Unaware of his triumph, he started a third run when the boat hit a log and somersaulted out of the water. Henry Seagrave and his mechanic were killed. For the last few minutes of his life, Henry Seagrave had achieved his ambition by holding both land and water speed records. He was just 33 years of age. When Seagrave was killed on Windermere, it was an, not just a national tragedy, it was an international tragedy. Papers in Paris had headlines saying, bow low to this hero. He was internationally renowned in Italy. The poet Gabriele D'Annunzio was absolutely besotted with Seagrave. From a motorsporting point of view, it was an absolute tragedy. <laughs> 